One of the things that makes Hypebar so powerful as a platform is the ability to create whole sets of functions that interact with each other and to rely on functions that other people have written. There are a lot of existing workflows and functions that do really useful things on Hypebar. And so what this means is you don't have to build everything yourself from scratch if you want to build up something sophisticated. So one example of a workflow on Hypebar that people are using quite a lot is a workflow we call Hypebar Space. Um, this is a tool for doing kind of quick automated test fits and space layouts. And I'll show you how it works here briefly. And then we'll look at how to add new space types to Hypebar Space using Grasshopper. So I'm going to click the Hypebar Space template. If you don't see this up here, just look under New Workflow and go find Hypebar Space. And I'm going to click here. The way that Hypebar Space works, it has a, a little bit of input information about existing conditions like the floor and the core and other information. So first, I'm going to go to the floors by sketch function and click add a floor. And I'm just going to draw a floor here. And maybe I'll make this like, I don't know, 170 feet in this direction. And we'll go like this. save. And as soon as we have a floor, Hypebar Space is going to try to do some sort of basic layout for us. It's going to place a core. It's going to generate a kind of pretty normative circulation. Um, and we can manipulate all of these things. I can get in and say, actually, I don't want my core to be this big by clicking on the core and choosing edit. And then I can just manipulate this geometry. So let's do that. Let's make our core a little smaller for this floor plate. But you'll see it's also automatically doing furniture layouts for the spaces in this model. And it chooses what furniture to lay out based on the space type that's assigned. So there are a few different functions in this workflow that are important. One of them is space planning zones, which here I can isolate just so we'll look at it, which creates the circulation and these kind of colored zones. And these zones can be assigned a different program type. So I can say, actually, I want this band to be of type private office and hit save. And then there are all of these functions, which are responsible for doing the furniture layout in spaces of different types. And so before, the open office layout was handling creating furniture in all of these spaces. But now, because I changed it to private office, a different function has kicked in, which is now creating a range of offices here in these spaces. So the cool thing about this is that this is all totally open and extensible. So anyone can get in here and create a new space type and publish a function that creates that space type. And all you're responsible for is creating the logic for what happens inside those spaces. And Hypebar takes care of the rest. So what I'd like to do is create a new custom space type. And then we're going to implement the logic for it in Hypebar. And so let's see how that works. So I'm going to need to create a new function. Um, so I'm going to go back to Grasshopper, and I am going to create a new blank Grasshopper document, and I'm going to choose Create a New Function. So we're going to say this is my custom space type. Uh, creates a layout inside a custom space type. And I'm going to need to specify some inputs. Um, I might have some sort of like a size control here. And I'll make that, again, a length value. And then I also want to be able to tell it what space, what space type I should be filling in uh, with this. So, you know, in, the, in this example, there are sort of hard-coded names like open office or private office, but if I click this and say I want this to be custom or some other name that I give it, I can actually type in other values here. And so I want to be able to also specify in my grasshopper function what name this function should be responsible for filling out. So we're going to create a string input and we're going to call this the space type name. Uh, which space type should we fill in? And I'm going to provide a default value here of custom as well, just so that it'll it'll be filled in to give our users a hint. And I'm going to change the range here. I'm going to set the max to be like 10 meters, and I'll set the step to be like something small. And I'll 
find some default value or I can type here and say maybe our default will be like five meters. And we'll click next. And this is where we start connecting to other functions. So to be able to use these spaces that are generated by another function, I have to express to Hypar that I have a dependency on this space planning zones function, which is creating them. And so I'm going to click about on this function and find out the information that I need to connect to it. So I'm going to go to the connections tab and I can see there are two pieces of information that are really important. One is the model output name. So I'm going to take this and copy it exactly as it is space planning zones. And over here where I'm creating my function, I'm going to add a model dependency on space planning zones. And this is not optional. Uh, it's not something that I want to hide when I uh, create my result. So I'm just going to leave this as is. And then the other thing that's important is I need to know what kind of element I'm expecting to be getting from this function. So there are this function produces a bunch of different stuff. It produces these. Uh, space boundaries, it produces floors, it maybe depends on other types. And so Hypar is a system that's designed to allow you to kind of express custom complex types, BIM elements, or, or you know, just sort of abstract constructions that you want to work with. And so I happen to know that these sort of jello cubes are of the type space boundary. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste that in under my element types. And I can either paste the URL or just go look for it in the list. So I know that there, these are elements of type space boundary that I want to refer to. And another way of knowing this, by the way, is just by clicking on one of these elements, I can see that it says space boundary here. If I wanted to depend on information from the core, then I could click on this and see that it's of type service core. And I'd go look at the core by floors function to find its model output and use that as a dependency. But for now, all we really need are the space boundaries that are coming from the space planning zones function. And so we need a dependency on space planning zones and we need the uh, a reference to this type of space boundary. We'll click next. I'm not going to produce any data outputs this time, although you can if you'd like. And we'll hit publish and then copy this ID, return to Grasshopper and paste. And so now, just like last time, it's going to spin up some components for me that have the information that I need so that I can start to sort of build out my logic. And so I'm going to separate these a little bit. I also think because we're dealing with more complex types like these space planning zone boundaries, um, I'm going to want to pull in some example information that I can work with. I've got default values for the space type name and the size, but space planning zones is empty because I don't have any sort of default set to work with. And so I want to grab an existing workflow to pull that reference information from. So I'm going to go back over here to hyperspace and I'm going to grab this workflow URL from the top. I'm just going to select and hit copy. And then I'm going to say test function on Hypar, test in an existing workflow since this already exists, or I could create a new one and build all this up from scratch. But we're testing in an existing workflow. I'll paste and click connect to workflow. And as soon as I do this, then this is going to go grab the information from this Hypar workflow and make it available for me to kind of start designing with in the Grasshopper environment. This might take a second because there's a lot of stuff being produced by that function. We can pull up the Rhino window as well when this is ready. So it successfully pulled that information. I can see that there are elements and things coming out of here. So let's go uh, bring up our window. And what I want to do is actually, it looks like maybe we didn't get any elements. Sometimes you'll have to hit, oh, I know why. It's given me a warning. No instances of this function in the workflow. So in order to be able to do this, we have to actually add a version of our function to the workflow. And so uh, we called this custom space type. And so we're going to click add function and go find custom space type uh, or you know what, because I created this uh, 
after uh, I open this workflow, I'm gonna have to reload just to make sure that it's available there in the list. So if you're missing a function that you know you already created, you can always just reload the window. So we're gonna look for our custom space type. There it is, click add. And now there's a copy of this in the workflow. And you'll see this little yellow exclamation mark and a warning that no grasshopper function logic was found. So right now, this all this is is a set of inputs. It, you've, we haven't yet published a version of the hyper function. We haven't created any logic. But now that we've done this, it should be able to actually pull in the information. So now it's using the values that this function is receiving to populate the inputs so that I can start to work with. Now we should be able to hit refresh and pull in all of that live information. Usually you only have to do this once and then once it's connected, it will sort of keep it up to date for you. Um, but sometimes you need to sort of refresh it manually just to get it to reconnect to that workflow. There we go, it says updated successfully. And now I've got a list of elements that are coming in here. Now it's giving me elements of many different types. And so what I wanna do, let's just bring up Rhino again, um, is I wanna sort out which types of elements I'm actually interested in. So from the Hypar tab, we're gonna grab the elements by type component. And this is gonna allow us to sort all of the elements that are coming in which now, you know, before we were only dealing with just simple data like strings or text and numbers, and now we have elements, we're gonna need to use a few more components to get at the information we need from them. So if I plug in space planning zones to elements by type, this is going to sort out the elements based on what type is available, and then I can go looking for just the space boundaries that are coming in. So in order to do something with these, I'm gonna need to get at their properties using deconstruct element. So these things, whenever you see hypar element as one of the values, um, you can use deconstruct element in order to get at more information as well as the geometry. So as soon as I do this, it generates outputs on this component for all of the properties associated with space boundaries. So I have access to all of this information. I can see them in my model and I have information like what is the name of these elements. And because when I was over here, I selected this guy and gave it a program type of custom, then I can now see in my workflow here that some of these have a program type of custom. And so the first thing I wanna do is say, I only wanna do this logic where the space boundary is of type custom. And remember that we're taking that in as an input. The, name, the space type name is another one of these inputs. So basically what I wanna do is filter out these space boundaries based on their program type, where that program type is equal to the space type name that is being fed in as an input. Okay, so what we wanna do is take these values for program type and find only those space boundaries whose program type is equal to the space type name that's specified. So we'll use a text match component to just check whether the program type value, which could be open office or custom, matches the pattern, which in this case is the space type name that we want. So that's custom, and this is gonna create now a Boolean list for us It'll only be true for any values where that space boundary program type is custom. And then we're gonna use that to dispatch the elements, these space boundaries that we want. We could also just dispatch the properties off of this, but I kind of like the cleanliness of this pattern, even if it means we're deconstructing the element a couple times. So now we've only got the single space boundary that 
matches this. And if we added more, then it would show us more. And we're going to use deconstruct element here again, just to grab all those properties. And I can turn off preview for these guys. And now I want to actually create some logic for my layout. And I'm going to do something a little silly here. I think I'm just going to create a, uh, I'm just going to create like a, I don't know, like a grid of columns or something. Um, so, you know, I'll leave it up to, to you to come up with smarter and more interesting layouts. So what we want to do is grab the boundary of this space boundary. Um, and you can see there's a boundary property and that's creating a surface. So if I look at this, this is just that kind of surface there at the base. And I'm going to use divide surface to create some points on that. And I'm going to use uh, my size to decide basically to, to be sort of like a grid size. And so I also want to make sure that I sort of divide the dimensions of this surface. So this is the way that I do kind of like an even grid. I'll get the surface dimensions using the dimensions component. And then I'm going to divide u by whatever value here is for size. And then I'm going to do the same for v. Just copying and pasting this, dividing basically. So this gives you sort of a rough sense of like the dimension along the edge of each of these surfaces. And then I'm dividing that by the size that I want for my grid so that I get a sort of rough count that I can use for my U and V subdivisions. And then I get a nice even value here. And if this value were something else, if it were smaller, we would see more of these populated. And so at each of these points, I want to create a column and I want to pass those out. So before we just created boxes and meshes and elements and just pass them directly out. But oftentimes you want richer, smarter elements uh, to use in your HyperR workflow. And so for that, we're going to construct an element. Before we've been deconstructing these elements and getting their properties out, but we can use construct element to create elements of our own. And if I right click this, I have access to a bunch of built-in types like columns and floors and things. And I also have access to space boundary because it was one of the elements that I added there in my element types when we were configuring the function. So if you want to add new types here, you can add them there. So I'm going to create a column. A column has a certain bit of information. It has a location and it has a height. And in this case, I'm just going to set the height to like, I don't know, three meters. Um, we could do something smart, like pull it off of the space boundary. But for now, I'll leave it like this. And then we need a profile, which is going to be the shape of this column. And for that, I'm just going to do a rectangle. Uh, and uh, I'm going to pull that in here. And now we see our columns. Those are looking a little big to me. So maybe I'll do like a slider value and I'll make those X and Y. And so those will control that. Um, if I were getting fancy, maybe I could use a component like uh, Wombat's centered domain uh, in order to make sure that those were basically constructing this from a, to a domain from negative half that to positive half that. That's up to you, not really necessary, but uh, we'll do it anyway. And then that's it. Now that this is creating information, I don't actually need to fill in any of this additional, these additional inputs. And so now I can pass that into my model output. I can hit publish, make sure I call this my, my column room. And now it says updated successfully. So it has updated that function and published it to HyperR. So now I should be able to go back to my HyperR window and try modifying one of these values to get it to re-execute. And now it's actually calculating that layout with all of the columns that I created in a space that I designated as custom. And if I make another space and make it into custom and hit save, then it should run that one as well, as long as I did everything right. Lo and behold, we've got our columns in those spaces as well. So this is a really easy way to take Grasshopper and just start building out new space types for hyperspace and to kind of use this general hyperspace space planning framework, but with all custom spaces that you develop and design. So 
I'm sure we'll cover more details about this in future tutorials, uh, but that covers it for today. Uh, with this, we've kind of looked at how to create hyper functions and how to build stuff that's based on results that you pulled from other functions as dependencies. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and feel free to join us on Discord if you do have questions or want to discuss this further. Um, you can always find our Discord by going to your user menu on Hypar and choosing Discord, and that'll take you to our discussion group where we're available for support or just friendly chat.